Uh, so good evening, everyone, and uh, I thank you for your remaining energy and, and uh, focus. My presentation today is entitled Type and Elementary Structure, the Anthropological Turn. Uh, and just like Vasilis, um, I'm not looking today at um, the topic of uh, my research, but rather a tangential topic that I thought would be um, valuable to um, study for today's presentation uh, as an opportunity for me personally to develop uh, a methodology in my research. Sorry. <laughs> So, as was said by Marson um, at the beginning of the day, the discourse on uh, type develops in the 60s out of a critical rereading of the modern movement, rejecting its naive functionalism, its commitment to standardization, relentless mass production. Faced with this crisis of moder modernity, a new series of writings emerge, which turn instead to historical experience and the notion of type in the attempt to reclaim meaning for architecture. So, as Vidler writes, the radical new idea of the third typology was to identify the nature of form as neither scientific, which was the idea of the first, nor technical, which was the second, but rather essentially architectural. And this essence of architecture emerges as the idea that form, rather than following function, results from a mere a complex set of human practices and behaviors. So if form is a product of human behavior, then it can be analyzed with the same methods and concepts used in social sciences. At the time in the 60s and still in the 70s, the dominant approach was that of structuralism. Broadly speaking, structuralism assumes there are common deep structures that underlie complex and diverse phenomena. And the goal of the structural analysis is to find those common roots and commonalities. In the architecture of the city, Alorossi specifically refers to the methods of the Swiss linguist, Ferdinand de Saussure, uh, stating that um, his method of um, analysis could be translated into a program for the urban sciences. In Variations of Identity, Carlos Materis um, proposes that the methods of structural anthropology of Claude Lévi-Strauss could be used as a literal model for typological analysis. Materis goes on to suggest that the idea of type is equivalent to that of elementary structure, a concept proposed by Lévi-Strauss in his studies on kinship. Levi-Strauss, through structural analysis, sought to break down very different kinship systems to the same four elements, uh, husband, wife, son, and mother's brother. In the same manner, the architect, through typological analysis, could study apparently heterogeneous buildings and then extract a set of types, which he understands as the elementary structures of architecture. So this discourse of on type uh, spans nearly four decades uh, from the writings of uh, Rossi in the 60s, uh, ending uh, with that of Materis in the early 90s. And as we have said, this uh, discourse fades out in the late 90s. And this line of thinking that connects um, these writings remains committed to this historical idea of type and to the structural method. <laughs> My uh, research has led me to come across a significant body of ethnographic house studies that were written in the parallel decades to the discourse on type. The house as a topic of study in anthropology uh, was not new at this point. It was pioneered in the uh, mid 19th century by Henry Lewis Morgan. His book, Houses and House Life of the American Borygines was the first to study how house form relates to social life. However, while in the early studies, the house was thought of a case of uh, mere symbolism, with the advent of structuralism uh, in the 60s, the house uh, starts to be seen as more than just a container of social processes, rather it's seen as uh, the social process. And so the study of the house comes into its own and develops into a research tradition. While sparked initially uh, by structuralism, this is interest in houses uh, sort of moves beyond uh, this uh, approach, revising and adjusting its method of inquiry. And so today I would like to examine these two parallel discourses uh, that are, while are different under many aspects, I would argue uh, are both uh, aiming to understand the deep structure of built form. Specifically today, we'll look at four case studies um, that I think are paradigmatic in describing this trajectory and that I hope could provide a point of discussion in, in critiquing type and in laying the grounds for the fifth typology. Uh, 
So these two discourses, uh, as I said, are both uh, in searching this uh, deep structure of buildings, inevitably investigate the link between behavior and form. And so Carlos Matieri suggests in his book that form appears when a human activity becomes stable and is ritualized. The diagram is trying to depict a quote uh, where he says, ritual can be understood as the tangent point between the world of form and that of activity, the only point from which architecture can be shaped. So if form is the embodiment of rituals, then type is the permanence of those ideas in time. Rossi's research at ETH on the territory of the Caton Ticino shows how in traditional cultures we find um, a rigorous adherence to type. This is because type is heavily loaded with symbolism, and more than being just a mere efficient response to climate or topography, it is the way through which identity, uh, culture, and social groups are formed and reproduced. Especially in the absence of literary tradition, um, type is the most effective way of transmitting ideas from one generation to the next, and hence it's instrumental in socializing people. And so for this reason, the, the traditional house type has been studied uh, in anthropology as a heuristic device uh, through which to understand um, native worldviews. And one of the most famous examples of anthropological house analysis is Clark Cunningham's 1964 study of the house of the Atoni people of West Timor, an island in the Indonesian archipelago. And I won't dwell on the house itself, but rather focus on how Cunningham um, analyzes the house. So the house of the Atoni, he writes, are not built according to individual whim, but rather follow patterns uh, and are put together according to a specific order. Order in the Atoni House, the title of the essay, is a system of rules and principles passed down from elders. It determines orientation, structure, where things are placed and used, and the behavior of those included and excluded from the house. To try and describe this order, Cunningham maps out the location of the most significant important elements that seem to occur in multiples of four, starting with the four cardinal points that determine the orientation, followed by the four corner uh, posts, the four key elements within the house, um, the door, the water jar, the two platforms, and the four um, mother posts that support the rafters and the ceiling, ending with the central hearth. He then links these elements into a pattern, which he sees as rep uh, either in a, a cross diagram or a concentric pattern, and arguing that these diagrams express the general principles of spatial organization, that of combining a series of lateral divisions into fe female and male dualities combined with concentric principles, and ultimately the idea of unity and difference combined in one. And so for Cunningham, this diagram represents not only a model for how the house is put together, but that of all, all of society, politics, and general worldview is conceptualized. And so for me, this idea of order as presented by Cunningham is very close to the notion of type because uh, order like type expresses a priority and the internal logic of space. And so I would argue that this desire to diagram order in the attorney house follows the same sort of structuralist attitude that is behind the discourse of the third typology. In fact, in later articles, Cunningham goes on to compare different houses, concluding that common structural principles underlie these local variations. So this idea of order is expanded in 1970 by Pierre Bourdieu in his well-known essay, The Berber House or the World Reversed, in which he described the traditional house of the Kabyle people, a group uh, living in the Atlas Mountains of northeastern Algeria. Um, he, here he identifies the house as a microcosm of the Kabylian world. Uh, he famously calls it a book that contains an encoded message uh, that is absorbed and internalized by those who grew up in this house. Mm. And uh, he goes on to describe the house as organized according to a set of binary oppositions that re re reflect gender symbolism, uh, those of dry, wet, cooked and raw, light and dark, high and low, day and night, female and male, etc. So like Cunningham, he extracts from the house a series of oppositions. However, he notes, when one crosses the door of the house, this set of symbolic opposites rotates 180 degrees around the threshold. So what? So these sets of oppositions that were dividing the inside from, of the house are now what divides the house from the outside world. And so here we find the idea that depending on perspective and position, there can be more than one order uh, coexisting. 
leading the house to have what Bourdieu calls a double significance. By the 1980s, the structuralist approach in anthropology had come unstuck. Bourdieu looks back at the Berber house study and calls it his last work as a blissful structuralist. There was an increasing skepticism towards the idea that uh, all of culture could be analyzed with a limited set of rules. And in this light, uh, anthropologist Ellen Roy uh, in 1986 studies the traditional house of the Nualu people in the island of Saram in Indonesia. He also, however, uses the essay uh, as an opportunity to develop a critique of structural house studies. House studies. Specifically, he rejects the idea that uh, one can find a single fixed order in the physical structure of the house. So he's rejecting this idea of order that's like a code uh, waiting to be cracked. Uh, and once you crack this code, you can explain all of social relations in their entirety. He questions this, uh, this overly coherent and systematic um, analysis. Instead, he writes, in my experience, what is most interesting about houses is that they not merely express order, but that the order they express may be of various kinds, understood in different ways by different people on different occasions. Roy includes uh, diagrams of the major symbolic contrasts of the Nualu house. However, he warns his reader on the risks inherent in selective representation. He argues Western methods of drawing, such as 2D floor plans and even 3D axonometrics will inevitably distort and simplify the meaning which stems from diversity and complexity. And this is true, especially of houses that were not conceived with those methods of representation. So he writes scholars in their tendency to subscribe to the simple reduce reality to basic patterns. However, the traditional house as a symbolic domain cannot be distilled into a neat diagram. In 1993, uh, Clifford Sather builds on Roy's critique. Uh, Sather is looking at the longhouse of the Iban people that live along the Paku River on the island of Borneo. Building on Roy's uh, critique, he addresses order in the longhouse, writing, what is most interesting yet is not simply that the house may express different orders, but that these orders are actively created, contested, and rendered convincing in the ongoing processes of social life including, importantly, those of ritual. So instead of trying to extract a code or a static diagram, he instead describes the logic of the house through the movement of rituals. Specifically, he uh, describes in detail the rites of birth and death that are structured as linear journeys through the spaces of the house. These rituals consist of prescribed gradual transitions from more secluded spaces, such as the private family apartment, to uh, increasingly more shared spaces, uh, such as the open air veranda or the shared gallery, um, ending in public spaces, uh, such as the bathing place along uh, the river. So the sequence of movements that occurs in a loop uh, from areas of uh, maximal to minimal privacy or uh, minimal to maximal spiritual danger is reflected in the spatial organization of the house, which is the series of conceptual gradients in a bi-directional orientation. So this close link uh, between ritual and form uh, uh, is acknowledged in the discourse on type. Uh, for example, Matiris talks, talks about this when uh, referencing the markets in European uh, Mediterranean cities. The markets, um, the exchanging of products from land and the sea in the context of um, the city is an ancient activity. Uh, originally, however, the line uh, between the market and the public space was blurred with streets and squares transforming into open air markets. Um, he writes, when the market breaks off from the public space and becomes a separate building, the points of sale are laid out like houses, all lined up along streets that form blocks and squares. So in the sense, when the market becomes a building, it reproduces the liturgy of the market and the logic of the urban fabric. While acknowledging the importance of use and human activity and the role it plays in forming types, however, these contingent aspects of use uh, quickly become secondary in practice. The search uh, for elementary structures led architects to extract these clear forms uh, removed from their historical and contingent dimension. So the structural approach, when translated into a design tool, um, had the limit of transforming types into images. And to avoid these pitfalls um, of this totalizing tendency, I would argue instead that type is most helpful when used as an analytical tool. <laughs> 
And as we have seen in the tradition of uh, anthropological house studies, uh, scholars were able to sort of progressively critique uh, this method of structural analysis, understanding that the goal should be to, not to find the structure per se, the diagram, but to use that method of analysis to find those forces that are shaping uh, built form, be those that of ritual movement or the, uh, you know, that of industrial capitalism. So the notion of order um, was expanded and revised from a more fixed static understanding to a more nuanced one, opening up uh, to see use, movement, and the passing of time as important notions to be reckoned with when um, studying the logic of space. So order, because it was developed in, a, in the field of anthropology, is freed from this pressure of uh, turning the analysis into a design, into a built form. And so it remains a purely analytical tool. And as such, uh, it also um, it puts on the same plane that of uh, built form and use as equally important notions in analyzing space. So in rethink rethinking uh, type, perhaps as order, could prompt us uh, to, um, to question uh, what is this framework of the fifth typology. Uh, personally, uh, I would suggest it could lead us to consider analogies that go beyond uh, spatial, um, spatial similarities. Considering, for example, uh, the di a diachronic and just not a uh, synchronic dimension, so examining the building as a process, uh, looking at its construction and life cycle, uh, Tracing, for example, analogies uh, for, in concepts such as ownership, inheritance, and property, as well as relationship to the territory and environment, uh, and obviously, as we have seen, uh, movement, use, and ritual. So, in this slide, I wonder if the fifth typology uh, could, could be a, seen reframed as an investigative framework, a bottom-up, more cross-disciplinary method of analysis aimed not at uh, comparative reductions to basic patterns, but rather at understanding the influence of forces that might not be immediately visible as a diagram. Thank you, Randa. Um, questions? Um, thanks so much, yeah. Getting tired, sorry. Um, yeah, I think it's really great research. Um, and I love the questions that you've set up at the end because, for example, I was wondering um, if the production of the form is ritualized as well, of course, the production of the of these houses, you know. Um, because if we're not, you know, on, on one hand, when you analyze it psychologically, let's say you you draw out these patterns of of feeding, um, scaling operations, which somehow, you know, as you as you say very well, I think through through the ritualization of the maybe of the I'm adding the production of the form, but then the reproduction of the form of the house, there there's a reproduction of the world. And I think the really interesting part about this is that also what you're touching on specifically is the ability to participate in the reproduction of the world from a very tangible mm -hmm. material level. Mm -hmm. So so that's, yeah, that's really exciting. I think, I mean, some, some things that you, yeah, so I'll, I, I love this as well, because then of course, you know, inheritance, ownership, property becomes something that maybe unfolds ritually out of this kind of um, this reproduction of that world, that world as well, but in a participatory form or not in a super rigid form, probably um, maybe in these in these historical examples. But that's also, I guess, where you can go is to, is to somehow one. Sorry, one thing that I wanted you to clarify or repeat was um, you mentioned something about um the binary becoming i think it was levi strauss that you mentioned this concept um of the binary becoming breaking down the binary somehow if if that makes sense 
Um, I think I mentioned the binary in the uh, in the Bourdieu. Oh yeah, yeah. Diagram so Bourdieu, that yeah. he analyzes as, as sets of oppositions, like metaphors on ultimately a gender uh, binary, but like yeah. expressed in different met metaphors of. Right, and then yeah. you mentioned a concept at the end of that. What was? Um, that he sees that as um, there being more than one order because what uh, what separates the inside of the house, these yeah. two categories are then like what separates the house from the outside world. Yeah. So all the mm -hmm. associations with uh, the female that are one side of the house are then associated with the whole house versus mm -hmm. everything that's outside. Right, right. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. Right. Okay. Great. No, yeah, it's, it's really exciting. So I'm just anxious to see where it goes. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. A um, really wonderful presentation and also a great way for us to end the day and for you to start actually your, your work. And I think actually the critique of structuralism was uh, to me particularly successful because when you know when you started actually from structural anthropology, of course, uh, I, I was wondering where are you going to go? Uh, but I think the fact that you contextualize it historically coming up also with a critique towards that method, I thought was really brilliant. Which of course brings me to the point that uh, that to, touches me particularly, having a, a not a lot, but a few PhD candidates who are working actually with um, with the instruments of anthropology. One defending, in fact, in a couple of weeks, and uh, we are all very acutely aware that right now the anthropological method is really academically speaking under attack. So if you come to something with an anthropological approach, especially as a PhD candidate, I and you know and my students, we are already preparing ourselves actually to to field questions that have to do with the original scene of anthropology, that is the fact that anthropology others, yeah, others its subject, right? Mm -hmm. So the moment that you enter kind of, you know, kind of anthropological reading relationship with your subject matter, subject matter is there and you are here. Obviously, there's an enormous colonial legacy to anthropology and so on and so forth. So I think the fact that you are putting your subject matter actually in a, in a historical perspective really allows you not only to make a critique of structuralism, but also to make a critique of anthropology, right? Mm -hmm. uh, which is especially evident, I think, towards the end of your presentation. And that, I have to say, it's really well done. Uh, because notwithstanding the fact that, that I and my students, we keep using, of course, anthropological instruments, uh, I think this awareness of the fact that anthropology is really deeply problematic, uh, I think it's not wrong, uh, and, we, and we have to accept that somehow, because definitely, and, you know, the colonial legacy is even visible in the type of case studies, of course, that then these uh, scholars engage with, sure. with the fact that then they even use labels uh, that are typical, you know, white male labels uh, on, on conditions that maybe, where maybe men are not called men and women mm -hmm. are not called women, and so on and so forth, right? Which leads me to the, the thing that I found the most interesting, actually, in the presentation, and I think I, I will keep thinking about it really for, for a while. To me, the fact that actually this anthropological lens, lens, uh, lens or, or glance, let's say, uh, others the subject is interesting because it raises the question whether type isn't always a, a constructed category that comes from outside. Mm -hmm. So whether in a way this is an original scene, not of your guys, of your anthropologies, but of all of us when we use the concept of type. Mm -hmm. Whether in fact actually to someone who practices, uh, you know, the building, the living, even the designing, uh, type is not it doesn't exist, it's transparent somehow, it's just the way we do things, right? And so I think when you get to actually type as an analytical instrument, I think this is the case, the type is an analytical instrument that we mostly use actually coming from outside. So in a way, the anthropological lens really does make sense. Mm -hmm. Everything that all of us did today, and we will do tomorrow as well, because for sure, in my presentation, in your presentation, we are, we are othering our subject and we are trying to actually, you know, like, you know, almost, almost mainsplain to them, actually, mm -hmm. this is the way you are living, if mm -hmm. you don't know, right? Mm -hmm. So I think that, but this, I don't see it, I don't see it as a problem. I think that once we are aware of that, I think it is really interesting because then it means that type is nothing else but an ideological instrument that we use to make sense of, of things happened either in history or, you know, here and now. And, and I think the the nakedness of that awareness of the fact that type is a construct and, you know, it's really in the hands of whoever actually, uh, you know, makes it explicit, uh, mm -hmm. that I think is really, really powerful. And to me also liberating because it means that there's no right or wrong at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. uh, that is what I really enjoyed actually in your presentation. That, that You know, for many years, uh, you know, I've been in a few actually symposiums of, of type, well, you know, about type both as a as, you know presenter, but also in the audience since I was a student. And the problem is that at the end of the day, no one can ever agree on what is type. And, and you walk away always dissatisfied because you're like, well, we didn't really solve anything, right? But I think to me, what your presentation actually puts on the table is that maybe this is exactly the point, that type is always an anthropological tool that always others the, the content and always actually is just an excuse for whoever talks 
to to make sense of the world around them exactly as anthropology uh, did right and uh, and i think that not only i don't see that as a negative thing i, I think it's actually for once uh, i will walk away saying okay now yeah this is actually like it can be useful if if it's seen that way and, I, and then a very very uh, quick note about actually the question of um type as, as an ideological tool right very often when i see these uh, anthropological diagrams i'm wondering how did they you know how did they come up with the fact that you know women are in that corner and men are in that mm. because actually how do they know that the people who interviewed mm. they interviewed for instance are telling them the truth no, i always wonder uh, that too. i'm saying that because i mean being i mean one of my subjects of study is uh, the, the ancient greek house uh, where until the mid 90s i would say we had an idea of for instance uh, you know things uh, like you know the the, um, the female part of the house and the male part of the house we were really convinced that these were typological truths and in then stone. The contradict I, I mean, it yeah. comes out that they didn't they didn't happen at all they were all in the mind of a few uh, yeah. authors uh, that uh, uh, you know that made an ideological construct out of that so i think it's, I mean, it's, it's not necessarily a question, but it's it's just that to me that reinforces the point that I think the point for type is not actually to be truthful in any way, but it's just one covers some kind of worldview that then becomes an interesting subject of discussion. Mm -hmm. Because I mean, how are we to know that actually the, the IBAN weren't uh, trolling? In fact, actually these anthropologists telling them things that are completely, <laughs> because we know that in other contexts this is the case, right? I mean, the, uh, recent archeology span has completely appended the way we look at the medieval house or mm -hmm. the, medieval European house or the, the ancient Greek house, for mm. instance. So, um, but I think once we are aware of that, and I think that that's the beauty of your presentation, that's not a problem because then then we go back to these categories that you try to mobilize at the end. And it's, we have a tool to think critically about things regardless of what the facts on the ground are. Mm -hmm. And that I think is for me very exciting and very um, a relief, I have to say. <laughs> I, I just wanted to open up the discussion more about the the viability of type in, in reading those kind of cultures and and of course projecting a certain otherness uh, which I agree could be uh, always a problem but for me there are um, two things that I think are important to emphasize uh, um, one uh, is that uh, a fundamental key to your application of typological reading is the question of ritual. Because uh, one can say that uh, something that is uh, really uh, universal in many cultures, if there is actually a universal thing across many cultures, is ritual in yeah. a way. And actually, it's something that uh, we see more and more today because we are in a society where uh, the idea of ritual is actually collapsing mm -hmm. in a way no? so uh, in a way ritual is something very universal to across many cultures but it's also something very historical because in a way now we live in an age uh, where uh, the survival of, of ritual practices is very much undermined so for me, that's a really important point uh, uh, that allow us to create this kind of milieu of examples that we are discussing, uh, also as, a, as an implicit critique of the historical moment in which we are, mm -hmm. you know, where many of these kind of conditions are either erased or disappearing. Yeah? Mm -hmm. um, and then the second is uh, uh, the, you know, why type is crucial in, the discourse on ritual, and Yolanda and I discussed this a lot, is because uh, in ritual, the dichotomy, the morphology, typology in a way disappear. Sure, sure. I mean, ritual is something where uh, uh, container and content are uh, somehow uh, Blurred, not, right? uh, not a valid uh, dichotomy in a mm -hmm. way. No, it's a dialectic, perhaps, mm -hmm. but not a dichotomy. Um, and also there is a, something else in ritual that is very important which is actually emphasis. Mm -hmm. In a way, ritual are all, is always an emphasis on habits uh, or things that are very quotidian, but they are performed with more uh, emphasis. Her ergo, uh, the form actually becomes really, I mean, building becomes very important mm -hmm. uh, because building really amplify uh, certain gestures that are very quotidian, but somehow they are ritualized. Uh, so in that sense, for me, um, 
you know, here the 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 reading uh, uh, of those uh, examples through uh, the question of type becomes really mm -hmm. really important, and perhaps uh, one of the few ways in which uh, uh, we can uh, reform the, mm -hmm. the idea of type mm -hmm. in a way by by in fact uh, somehow engaging with this kind of uh, methodological uh, revisions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's something else that I, that I think is important in the relationship between ritual and type. I completely agree with that. Uh, and it's also the fact that also reached the, the like the formation of rituals itself is a process, right? I mean, it's not static. Uh, and the formation of a ritual always starts with the moment of transgression. So with the moment with the, the, the incipit of the of the ritual is uh, in actually negating whatever actually the, yes. the, the, the everyday reality is, right? To then become then embedded in that reality and then the circle goes uh, back around. And I think that these so type of process which has been again studied by anthropologists and so on and so forth. Um, I find it interesting because I do think that one could apply it to the formation of type as well. Mm -hmm. So you have a moment, a bit, you know, when back to Michela's uh, presentation earlier, you have a moment of rupture in which actually the type emerges, uh, you know, struggles to be defined, then is defined, then most, most often this definition comes from outside uh, and then is embedded so seamlessly that, that it's almost, uh, you know, loses its uh, meaning and then the circle starts back again. So uh, I think that there's definitely a strong parallel between uh, ritual and type, both in, in terms of how they work, but also in terms of their historical, if you want, actually ebbs and flows. Uh, so I think it's definitely a very, very good uh, tool, you know, but both in terms of like literally connecting the two to read uh, the plans and so on and so forth, but also in terms of understanding them as processes, um, for sure. Yeah, well, I think one of the, the challenging and maybe also refreshing aspects of your presentation was the, I understood as well, the decision to, let's say, confront anthropology with the Rossian uh, lineage of um, typology. Well, I mean, there there have also been attempts of of turning anthropology and structuralism into architecture more directly. I mean, mm -hmm. those are not architects you mentioned, but people, I mean, the Dutch structuralists like Aldo van Eyck and, uh, and Herman Herzberger were, were people who tried to do that and maybe also tried to, I don't know, you could consider them as typologists, but in each case, they, so, and that's also what I'm wondering if, I mean, you could also say that one of the nice things about type is that it is not a process, is that it is more mm -hmm. or less fixed and immutable and maybe, I wonder if certain of these characteristics you mentioned are not almost contradictory to what we consider type mm -hmm. to be, but maybe, I mean, that could also be that, that that is exactly the fifth typology, a sort of iteration of of um, of typology today. But, but the very fact that, I don't know, I, I, you could always understand the type as something that is fixed and immutable mm -hmm. and that, that you could confront with processes and rituals. Sure, and, sure. But that is, a, I wonder what really happens if it's not also the danger of sort of dissolution of the type if you want wanted to incorporate um, all those kinds of uh, aspects, which is again what, what Aldo Van Eyck and Hesperger also try to do. Yeah, I, I, I think that, I'm oh, sorry, maybe, um, no, I think uh, this is something that was born specifically out of uh, my current topic of research, uh, which is like what I think what we said earlier, like, is it possible to um, speak of a type when we don't see spatial analogies? Um, and like in the case of the villa where there's no clear, maybe morphological um, analogy, but however, there's analogy in um, the type of um, uh, you know the the geographic location or the client or the architect or the exceptionality of um design and material choices um so i think i was just um you know for the in in the perspective of my research trying to see if it was possible to uh, expand um this typological search to um a series of sort of um processes um and not just um sort of recurring um you know similarities in a floor plan um which is what i was trying to understand um yeah i guess that brings back check i mean there, there's another question that we didn't we didn't really discuss today because maybe it's so obvious but actually it's not 
is the fact that we need words to refer to these things, right? Mm -hmm. So often the question whether a type remains fixed or not, for, for me, often it also has to do with this kind of misalignment with words. So for instance, I mean, when it comes to the villa, maybe the type has been constant uh, and actually rather unchangeable, mm -hmm. but then the way we use the word villa to address different things uh, has not always remained you know, fixed. Mm -hmm. So I think to me that the, the added question whether type is a pre-linguistic category or it's actually something that has to do with language, are we ruining it by labeling in a way? I mean, can we equate a label with actually the, the root of type? That is a whole other question uh, altogether, right? Uh, because sometimes actually there is a, there is a historical misalignment in the way in which we use certain words to address certain types. Mm -hmm. Sometimes there isn't, like basilica. We can kind of agree that you know it it stretched, pushed, and pulled, but we kind of all know what we are what we mean by that, right? But for instance, apartment. I don't think that there's any typological consistency. I mean, you know, I'm going to bring examples tomorrow. There has been like a big big shift in what that word went, meant uh, mm -hmm. and addressed, right? Uh, however, I, I would agree with Christophe, some characters actually were quite persistent, right? Mm -hmm. It's just that they misaligned with the term that we use actually to address them. So the whole the whole linguistic question for me is a whole different question altogether somehow. But, but for me, I'm from the crisis of both uh, <laughs> the Italian school of textual topology and the Dutch uh, the structuralist uh, school. Uh, is that as soon they found the uh, the concept, they 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 stick to that. I mean, they their work was not uh, fueled anymore by research. Uh, we know that uh, uh, Rossi in the early seventies stopped basically to do any uh, field uh, field work. He only actually wrote about concepts. Uh, and we know also that uh, both Van Eyck uh, and Erzberger never actually did the really anthropological research. I mean, they just quote uh, uh, maybe some reading uh, of, I don't know, the dog on uh, culture, but in a rather questionable way. And they were only interested to extract some sort of pattern, some kind of design principle. And I think what uh, Yolanda uh, is uh, saying, and I I think is really important that somehow uh, typological research in order to be valid uh, has to be continuous. Uh, cannot actually just uh, find uh, like uh, a principle and then repeat this principle uh, endlessly. And I think uh, that uh, uh, one of the biggest problem of typological research in architecture is that it, it has always uh, stuck, uh, stopped at the finding some ruler and then that's it and then there is no research and i think this is a very important maybe comment also to students that uh, uh, in a way uh, the only you know re research either is continuous it's constantly actually uh, sustaining itself uh, or is not research it becomes just like a, a justification a priori or a posteriori of a kind of design uh, uh, a design method uh, and 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 after a while run run its course uh, mm -hmm. and and we know that the problem of both uh, typology and dance and structuralism uh, is that this these things became just like uh, like uh, like a game that didn't really produce much then a few beautiful projects but somehow uh, as a as a design as a research tool they they were not really uh, producing anything more than just justifying design projects. Whether, actually, uh, there is only one thing that uh, came to my mind when uh, Christoph uh, actually uh, made his um, point about the fixity of type, uh, um, which I actually didn't come to, to my mind before. Uh, and I, I think maybe it could be an interesting footnote uh, in your uh, discussion on on type, because uh, um, uh, in a way, uh, uh, one of the source of Rossi anthropological turn, uh, if we can call it like that, <laughs> was actually the work, uh, among other sources, uh, uh, the work of Ernesto De Martino, mm -hmm. who is a, a very important uh, Italian anthropologist uh, who uh, was extremely influential in Italy uh, in the uh, post-war period. And uh, he has this kind of theory that I think uh, became uh, almost like uh, an influence on, on many intellectuals, including Pasolini and, 
that somehow ritual uh, is something that is a historical mm -hmm. uh somehow that uh, uh, in a ritual you cannot uh, 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 find the origin uh it tends to uh, survive mm -hmm. in fact uh you know if you think of ritual gestures like i don't know the, the sign of cross mm -hmm. uh, or uh, mm -hmm. you know you uh, you cannot find the origin mm -hmm. because even you know the, the cross, archetypes uh, of behavior is, exactly yeah. it, it survives uh, and it has a certain kind of a story it really speaks about the a historicity mm -hmm. of ritual which actually the martin also uh claim it was a way for uh, indigenous communities to defend themselves from external influences by maintaining this kind of uh, uh a, a historicity so I think Rossi was very fascinated by that uh, idea, uh, so hence the idea of type as a kind of timeless condition. Um, I mean, there is something very, uh, you know, the idea of fixity, the idea of uh, stillness. Uh, I think it's something that uh, uh, you could see also in, uh, in, in Italian intellectuals, Pasolini, but also Cesare Pavese. I mean, this fascination for the timelessness of, mm -hmm. the, of archetypes. The idea that, uh, you know, if history is this kind of, you know, series of events that change things, there is something that never changed. And for them, this, this was a very strong uh, uh, fascination. And in a way, I would say it was not completely uh, just a kind of rigidity of their method. It was also what they were searching for. But of course, it led also to very dubious positions, uh, uh, which was also this very conservative, uh, at times even reactionary uh, positioning. And I think the, this is very visible, for example, in the work of Rossi, where somehow this fixity then becomes this mm -hmm. over emphatic uh, celebration of architectural forms. Yeah. But that's why I thought the presentation was really successful because you stay within a specific time and place. Uh, so you are not, in a way, I, I, I thought that that was very smart because in a way you are, telling us about actually this development in anthropology and, and uh, architectural thinking, but you are already kind of historicizing it kind of. Uh, mm -hmm. So then, then we can discuss exactly the, these instances as, as a project and a project that by now has kind of, you know, run its course, right? Mm -hmm. So I thought that that worked, worked really well. You're not trying to say now we, we do the same. No, that is something that had specific. Of course, what I get interested in, and then if you had more time in the paper, I'm then really curious to know why then and why there. Mm -hmm. Why at that specific moment in time, mm -hmm. and why in specific places actually that kind of association between typological thinking uh, and anthropology mm -hmm. and ritual becomes important. Another obvious uh, uh, character is Rick Werther, uh, who wrote then the idea of a town about Rome that is all about the way in which actually essentially the, the city typology, the city the more typo morphology basically of Rome was uh, uh, was an index essentially actually mm -hmm. of rituals and that's of course a much much earlier text at the beginning of your genealogy let's say mm -hmm. uh, but I think uh, again it's a very fascinating fascinating text but also very problematic one mm -hmm. but I think uh, again what is really successful and I can imagine also then transforming this into an essay is the fact that you are historicizing this phase and so then then you know understanding why it happened in these places and why at that time and why it ended then in the 90s I think that 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 the kind of meta discourse of why this this uh, uh, historical critical moment mm -hmm. then that will become I think really really interesting and you can tie it up um, quite tidily I think actually in original say yes yeah, that's interesting if I just may add something in this brilliant conversation you know in this brilliant also presentation you had I find extremely important this anthropological turning you know especially in architecture because there was this tendency you know especially in the 40s the 50s and the 60s of talking about other other people's dwelling and houses as shelters, we as architects, you know. And anthropologists saw that houses actually house, what we call houses, much larger than a simple shelter, you know. Mm -hmm. and complex this, cultural. Yeah. yeah. And Current of course, culture. this go back to this, I don't know, like we can let's say, thing that architects are projecting their own ideas, you know, to the past in order to justify their own contemporary, let's say, choices, you know, and there's also probably, you know, already this wonderful critique of uh, André Leroy Gourcain, who was a French anthropologist, mm -hmm. who actually destroyed all this, uh, like the work of um, Gideon on mm -hmm. the eternal present, it was projecting ideas, again, on the past and things that were actually had nothing to do with how other people were used to, other people, I mean, people mm -hmm. in the past, you know, or humanity used to live and to the 
actually live, yeah, in the very essence of the world, you know. And uh, he was he was talking about like this indigenous, we call them, but okay, this is also very debatable term, you know, people in Indo uh, Indochina that if a, catac if a cataclysmic uh, event happens, we just cannot, and we see only, for example, like the, their corpses and their skeletons, you know, with a necklace. We have only the necklace in order to understand from the excavation what or was actually their culture that again he visits like a village now and he says that there's a certain continuity which is much richer and larger to do with all these wonderful things that you that you saw. And for me, this is very important today, like this, a critique that anthropologists have worked a lot, you know, on what we call dwellings, houses, or whatever you want to call them, you know. But still, architects we don't as artists, we don't receive any proper education from anthropologists, you know, in architecture schools. I mean, in a, in a in a manner that it enriches our own, you know, pedagogy, and it's not even a coincidence. I think that nowadays, like even the largest library, you know, in the world of vernacular architecture is the Library of Paul Oliver, you know, in Oxford. Yeah. It's run by guy Marcel van is an anthropologist. He's not an architect, you know. Even Paul Oliver himself, he was not an architect; he was a historian. Mm -hmm. So there is this problem between architects, you know, how architects they work. Mm -hmm. I don't know, the study mm -hmm. and how we analyze, you know, the cultures mm -hmm. of the past. And uh, yeah, and I don't have an answer, it's just a question that they would like to put to you. What did you mm -hmm. want that? Um, well, I think the short answer, I think, is that in these buildings, use and form are so intertwined that you can't speak of form without equally speaking of use. Um, and, um, and then in that sense, uh, maybe as architects, we, uh, I don't know. We uh, refuse to to focus on 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 the use as as much, uh, and so maybe there's a rejection or a sort of delining, delimitating what is our field and and what yeah, what is the object of our research. The, the, I mean, the design itself has been historically constructed to avoid uh, yeah. to separate user from from design. Mm -hmm. there, you know? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. as a subtraction. I mean that. Uh, uh, Maybe that um microphone. Line. Sorry, yeah, yeah. Oh, right. I, I think the question if that makes sense of what I'm thinking. Um, the question of the crisis of presence that De Martino raises is uh is fundamental, and somehow after this discussion and and thinking about your presentation, and um, it seemed to me that maybe these things that cannot be reduced to a typological process where design prefigures the plan and understands a formal abstraction from a process that's irreducible to a formal uh, abstraction has been happening obviously since Egypt, mm -hmm. where you know the there is. I love the idea that maybe this view, <clears throat> at some point in your presentation, I felt like you you drew the curtain behind which we cannot possibly pursue. An understanding mm -hmm. of these people's way of reproducing their world. And so ultimately, what would be really fascinating about that is is, I mean, either we say we can't represent that and we can't we can't in any way create any kind of abstraction, verbal, through line drawing, whatever. Uh, I don't know. Or on the other hand, I mean, maybe that's what we're trying to understand yeah. somehow. Uh, <laughs> but but yeah, no, I think the you know precisely these these in a in a way uh, these machines of presence or these processes of presence, to me at least I understand in Egypt that they're appropriated by by uh, an emerging state to provoke a crisis of presence and then to provide a means of restoring presence and and that's what heroic processions always did is they depicted chaos yeah. it's always about depicting the the chaos and the possible uh, uh collapse of the order of the cosmos and then showing the, and then the pharaoh ritually reproducing and restoring the order of the chaos somehow so the, i mean i see that very clearly and there, there's a really important question about that where where we stop and we we pull the curtain on sort of looking at how these things are, and and I I don't know I, I think in a sense I'm also getting the notion that simply the act of asking these questions exactly. is precisely exactly. our our means of restoring presence. Exactly. You know, if De Martino, if the critique of De Martino is that he didn't accept his own crisis of presence as a modern 
we in a sense are actually here kind of accepting our crisis of presence because actually one really interesting thing about this discussion overall is I think it's a this is a good thing maybe I'm just tired but I'm leading with more question many more questions about type and typology than I came with somehow so yeah thanks your last question no, it's not. It's not really a question. Just just adding some observations on this is that somehow, uh, and we are in an architectural school. There's a kind of uh, vicious circle around this, and no one is really questioning the essence of of, of the meaning of type or type. Think about our design studios. They are about an hospital, they are about a house, they are about a villa, they are about a bridge. So this means that already we are falling into this easy way of labeling, which Argan was criticizing Pevsner, saying never yielded any artistic result, whatever artistic that means. So somehow Argan also says, and we talked about this, he, he quotes Ursula and says this, there's the need for the suspension of uh, jugement historique. So the, the historical uh, judgment, we need, we need uh, to suspend it. And somehow I would say that we also need to, the suspension of, of disbelief. When we go to the movies and we say, this is about parrots that talk and we believe that parrots talk. We, we accept to play that game of suspend, suspension of, of, of disbelief to, to, to go into that narrative. And, and I think somehow we should also do the same relating, uh, thinking about types and, and, and structures of relations, forgetting the easy way of labeling. Because if you figure this out, every time we have a more complicated situation, what is the label? Oh, it's high hybrid. It's hybrid. Oh, it's an hybrid problem. Because we are just limited and we cannot address this complexity or the richness overlapping of relations or rituals, whatever. But we think in the essence of those things, we just need them as we said early this morning, to limit uh, friction and those rituals will continue to, to happen. Then the question is, will those special solutions enhance or limit? And normally, I think it's successful if they do not limit and we can somehow free ourselves from, from, that, from that idea. But maybe the question starts within the architectural school. And every time I start reading on sociology or, or archaeology, I still thinking that we are arriving late to this party of, of understanding the meanings of, of type and typology. And we should be at least along with them and not arriving all the time late late to it. So just, just to add nothing, because uh, I think we are more or less playing the same team. Mm -hmm. We are. 